Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 17th of February. Now, in the UK, we've just extended the vaccination rollout to 5 to 11-year-olds, or it's just been authorised, and that will be getting rolled out fairly soon. Is this a good idea? So much natural immunity at the moment. Should we be relying on natural immunity, or should we uh, be vaccinating at this younger age group? Some pretty interesting questions. Now, this has been debated in the UK for a long time, and to be fair, this is this is the press release here just from the uh, Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation, and some people might say they've been dragging their heels on this. They've certainly had it uh, for ages. It seems to have been politically stimulated to some extent, so Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland and Mark Drayford in Wales seem to want this, whereas uh, Boris Johnson in, in England was less keen. I do hope this isn't becoming politicised. I really hope that is not the case. But we'll be looking at it objectively as much as we can, as we usually do. So that's the press release. Let's look at what we're uh, talking about here. So um, now, 22nd of December, by way of background, the J JCVI, the Joint Committee on Vaccine, uh, Vaccination and Im Immunisation, Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, that's it, it recommended uh, vaccines, COVID vaccines, of course, to be offered to at-risk 5 to 11-year-olds, which is is sort of more understandable, really. Uh, the rollout of which officially began at the beginning of February, so a couple of weeks back, so it's pretty new. But now this is being extended to potentially 5 million healthy children. 5 million healthy children this is being extended to. And uh, according to the this website here, the JVCI themselves... Um, they, they say this, although this age group is generally at very low risk of serious illness from the virus, very low risk of, of serious illness, uh, a very small number of children, again, so a very small number of children they're talking about, who get infected do develop severe disease, and we know it is a very small number. Latest evidence suggests that offering the vaccine ahead of another potential wave, another potential wave, will protect this very small number of children from serious illness and hospitalisation. So this seems to be aimed at protecting a very small minority uh, against a, a minority disease in, in a potential future wave. Um, I, I get the impression that they're not making the case as strongly as I would like so far, but, but let, let, let's carry on. So we're talking about a potential future wave here. Uh, will will there be a future wave? Well, of course, no no one knows this. But with Omicron, we're getting high levels of immunity as, as we speak. And it's increasing hour by hour. Um, and they also say this will provide some short-term protection against mild infections across the age groups. So why you would want to vaccinate to provide mild, mild short-term? Short-term protection against mild infection. Quite why you would want to do that, I'm not too sure. But anyway, they seem to be worried out about a, a potential, a potential future wave. So the committee's therefore advised uh, a non-urgent. So they're saying it's non-urgent. What does that mean exactly? Well, hard to say. It's non-urgent. Call to five to eleven-year-olds to give the paediatric dose, the ten microgram dose. It's the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the paediatric vaccine. The two doses should be given at least twelve weeks apart between doses. Now this is a really important point um, in Europe and uh, the United States you certainly in the United States the time gap is way too small so in the United States in my view they're doing two things significantly wrong with the vaccination program one is they're not aspirating the needles giving rise to the potential of inadvertent uh, intravascular administration and the second is they're simply given the doses too close together so is this just me saying this, or does this come from a, a website like this, uh, where, where a lot of detail is is given from the from the UK government? And uh, it's a bit like a paper. This it's all got references in and things. So there's all the references there. So quite a thorough a document is is saying this. And let's look at what they're saying. Um, so they're saying uh, international data from adult programs so this is from adult programs a longer interval between doses greater than the three to four weeks scheduled usually in the united states is associated with a lower reported rate of myocarditis following vaccination now i would have thought we want the rate of myocarditis to be as low as possible of course we wouldn't want any at all but given that there is some myocarditis after mrna vaccines um, international data is showing that the risk of that is somewhat reduced. 
um, if the doses are given further apart. So why are the United States giving the doses so close together? This association expected also applied to the paediatric dose formulation when used in children, so it's likely to occur. So an important point there, giving the vaccines close together is, is probably, I think we could say that, probably increasing the incidence of myocarditis following vaccinations. And it, that trend is likely. So we should, in other words, what this is saying is we should get less cases of myocarditis in children following vaccination if we give the vaccine a longer period of time apart. And as we've said, it should be at least uh, 12 weeks between doses, at least 12 weeks between doses. And of course, we also know from Professor Niels Hoiby in Denmark that in Denmark they get a third as many cases of myocarditis as they do in Norway because he's introduced needle aspiration in Denmark. But of course, that's still being ignored by the authorities on both sides of the Atlantic. So why the United States doesn't change to widen the gap, I have no idea. The, the evidence is against them. Can the, can the CDC and the FDA claim to be evidence-based in this? I'll leave you to decide that. We need to follow the evidence wherever it leads. That was one of our sayings, wasn't it? Follow the evidence wherever it leads. If the evidence is saying, if you don't like it, then tough. The evidence is the evidence. This is the whole point of science. Uh, Professor Lim, Chair of the COVID-19 JVCI in the UK, the main purpose of offering vaccines to 5 to 11 year olds is to increase their protection against severe illness in advance of a potential future wave. Oh, OK, so it's an advance of a potential uh, future wave of COVID-19. Now, when will this potential future wave come? I wonder, um, love to have Professor Lim on if she wants to come and talk about this. But 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 to me, it would really seem if she's worried about a future potential wave that we know that giving vaccination now that that protection is going to gradually wane over the next few months. So if this potential wave hits us like a tsunami in March or April, then there probably will be some benefit from this. But there's no intimation that it will. And I don't think it will because Omicron's providing such high levels of protection. So if there is a future wave next November, December, the vaccine we give now is going to be pretty well useless against that. Surely it would be better when we know what the risks are against a new potential wave, when that starts coming along, to roll the vaccines out quickly at that stage. To do it now against something which may or may not happen doesn't sound any way to run national policy to me, to be quite honest. A potential future wave. And this is a direct quote from the site. The Department of Health and Social Care and the NHS England will advise on their plans for rollout. So this hasn't been rolled out yet. And uh, to be quite honest, I can't imagine the NHS is going to be chomping at the bit to get this started. But we'll see. Professor Paul Hunter, friend of the programme, of course, of this uh, video, of course, uh, I, I, I would uh, lean against offering to this age group for a number of reasons. So we would lean against it. There are actually, uh, f the, the cases are actually falling now at the moment. So cases are falling now as herd immunity increases. We are seeing fewer uh, than half the cases in this age group than we saw a little more than a week ago. So cases down by almost 50% in the week. And given that this vaccine rollout won't start till uh, April. <laughs> so we've got, so if cases continue to fall uh, throughout February and March, Will there be any cases left to vaccinate against in April? Just in case there's a future wave. It's a, <laughs> I don't know if they've just done a bad PR, PR job here or what, or if I've misunderstood the science, but uh, the scientific basis for this really does seem pretty tentative, as described here, I must say. A very small minority of a potential future wave. Um, the, 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 Paul Hunter again. Uh, the only reason we were giving is to hopefully protect them against disruption to schooling. Well, you know, if you're off school for a few days, it's hardly the end of the world, is it? And we haven't seen that the vaccine has done a huge amount to stop uh, those interruptions because, of course, Omicron is spreading amongst those that are vaccinated. Um, I, I'm sure the members of the JCVI uh, realise that Omicron is spreading amongst the vaccinated. Um, but to be quite honest, when you read their statements, that's not particularly clear. Uh, on, on their statements. It would be nice if that was expressed more clearly. Hope I'm just not in a cynical mood today, but even Mr Javid, Sajid Javid, Secretary of State for Health, NHS were prepared to extend this non-urgent offer to all children during April, so it's not going to come till April. 
So it's another, what, six weeks minimum till it starts, seven weeks till it starts. And by that time, the numbers are going to be remarkably low unless I am phenomenally wrong. Um, so parents can, if they want, so he's kind of saying it twice, can, and if they want, take up the offer to increase protection against potential future waves of COVID-19. But of course, by the time this future wave comes around, immunity will already have declined. So really a pretty unconvincing statement from Mr. Javid. Uh, this is more information from this group here that we've just been looking at. Uh, they go on to say this. <clears throat> Again, direct quote from their site. This is a direct quote from uh, this more detailed explanatory site uh, here from the uh, JCVI and they go on quite a bit about it but they do give evidence it's 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 it's, it's a good write-up what, what what they do cover is is good um it's estimated that over 85 percent of all children aged 5 to 11 will have had prior COVID-19 infection by the end of January and of course we're now two or three weeks after that and as we know cases have been very high with roughly half of these infections being due to the Omicron variant so we haven't really seen Omicron cause massive uh, threat to life in our children over the past few weeks we are pleased to say natural immunity arising from prior infection will contribute towards protection against the future infection and severe disease so that's good at least they're saying natural immunity arising from prior infection will contribute well hopefully it'll do slightly more contribute well, okay that's true that, scientifically that word is true it will contribute towards the protection against future infection and severe disease not least because it will cause long term we believe it will cause long term activation of the b and the uh, the t memory cells which we believe could hang around for years other than the antibodies which are only going to hang around for months Use of Pfizer-BioNTech uh, 10 microgram paediatric formulation vaccine should be encouraged for all pupils in the relevant academic years, children aged 11 to 7. Ele sorry, 11 to 12. OK, so let's let's leave that bit out there. So we'll take that as that bit there as a given. Direct quote from them, of course. But why? Why is this being advised? Uh, in the 11 to 12 year old age groups to reduce complexity in program delivery. Hmm. So the reason that they're extending this for all pupils is to make it easier to give out, to reduce complexity in programme delivery. And I, I would have thought that medicine should be individualised, not designed to make it easier to treat uh, millions of people all at the same time. Um, so to reduce complexity in programme delivery and uh, uh, expected re react uh, reactogenic events for individuals. Now, this, to me, this is a direct... The reason I put this out in full is it's a direct quote. And I put it out there because I don't understand it. So to reduce complexity in programme delivery, I understand. But what does this bit mean? And expected reactogenic events for individuals. So this is the way that people react... So what are they what are, what are they saying there? It, re it really just isn't English to me. Uh, are, are they saying there'll be uh, less reaction events to future potential viral infection if children are given this vaccine? Really, pretty. I, I don't know what that means. Uh, disappointing that. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I'm a bit dyslexic, so it's probably just me being a bit thick here, but I don't see what that means. Uh, and expected reactogenic events for injury. So they're giving it to all pupils in order to reduce reactogenic events. That's what they say. I don't understand it. Um, then they say... Um, this advice on the offer of vaccine for 5 to 11 year olds who are not a clinical risk group uh, and, and is considered by the JCVI as a, as a one off pandemic response. So the 5 to 11 year olds, in their great enthusiasm or lack of thereof, uh, they're, they are saying it's a one off uh, pandemic response. But I don't think we're in a pandemic at the moment. I think we're in an endemic. I think we're pretty well endemic now. As the COVID-19 pandemic moves further forward to endemicity in the UK. So that they agree it's moving towards endemicity, which is good. Uh, and they're going to review it further if it's going to be needed more. So even they're kind of almost backpedalling a bit saying, well, this is just a this is just a, a, a one off. So <laughs> politicians and uh, 
authorising bodies are approving this, but it has to be said not with great gusto as I'm reading it. As I say, unless I'm misinterpreting, that's why I put all the links in so you can you can get it right. Now, moving on to the latest thing for the um, Office of National Statistics. This is great, this site. Uh, m mostly clear, not entirely. But um, So I've been looking at the antibody bit here for natural immunity, but you can look at infections or you can look at it, you can look at anything. It's absolutely brilliant. Infection is still pretty high. Look, one in 20 people uh, in England in the week ending the 12th of February is still in an Omicron uh, Omicron wave, that's for sure. Thankfully, uh, hospitalisation is going down. So, what they're saying about antibodies? Well, let's just, <coughs> let's just look at some of the uh, <coughs> some of the data on antibodies. 10th of January to the 17th of January, antibodies. Children aged 12 to 15. In that age group, but 90 to 93 percent have already got antibodies. Pretty high, and we believe this is from the actual. We, we believe this is from the um, proper blood test taken during the national survey as well. Although that point isn't entirely clear. When you when you read the ONS website, it's not entirely clear whether they're talking about um, their school study or or their uh, national study. I'm pretty sure this is from the national study. Um, and here we here we see the uh, antibody positivity is higher is and data sources. So th this one here is the, the, that's the ONS survey there. So we see increasing levels of antibodies over 2021. Uh, interesting that that's vaguely oh, well not vaguely but very tightly correlated with the um, the REACT study from Imperial College and also the UK, uh, so UK uh, Health Security Agency Zero uh, Surveillance Programme uh, from NH Blood uh, and uh, Transfusion, Transplant Collection. So um, basically we see that all three ways of gathering this data are in accord and um, that shows it's very likely to be correct data. That means we can be pretty sure uh, that we are at now remember that is the hundred percent line there. So are we just a tad below hundred percent? Ninety-eight percent of people with uh, antibodies already in the UK. So pretty, pretty, uh, pretty convincing and reassuring. Sixteen to twenty-four year olds. Well, ninety-eight percent uh, have antibodies. Thirty-five point seven percent of those have had three vaccine doses. But the antibody levels are high. Um, now, some, some of this might be attributable to the first and second dose of vaccine, but a, a lot's attributable to natural immunity. Now, this group, of course, the 8 to 11 year olds, we have not been vaccinating. So all of this, all of this we can guarantee is due to uh, natural exposure, natural immunity. And as we saw, it's expected to be 85 percent pretty soon. So high levels of immunity. Now, of course, this is a minimum figure for reasons we'll see in a minute. Uh, age 12 to 15, it's higher. Uh, now, that some of those have had two doses of vaccine. That represents two doses. Some of those have had one dose of vaccine. And that represents the total amount of uh, immunity. Uh, for England, older people, this is for older people, 98.1% antibodies. And they're the numbers that have had uh, three, three doses of vaccine. But of course, the, these antibody figures um, are, are absolute minimum levels of immunity as we'll see just let me just give you some more information first um so children aged 8 to 11 63 to 72 percent have antibodies at or above the 42 nanograms per meal level because there's a thousand nanograms in a microgram there's a thousand micrograms in a milligram there's a thousand milligrams in a gram and there's a thousand grams in a kilo <laughs> so so anyway that's the that's the 42 nanogram level so if it's below than that it won't pick up it won't pick up. So quite a few people, children tested, will have uh, antibodies just below that level. Um, so it won't have uh, picked up. And of course, ONS is quite um, upfront about this, of course. Antibody concentration in nanograms per milliliter. Uh, and these are measuring immunoglobulin type type Gs uh, based on SARS coronavirus 2 trimeric spike protein. Now, the thing I'm unclear about at the moment, and this is a bit of a learning exercise, I've actually written to Paul Hunter to clarify this for me. Uh, I'm not sure if the trimeric spike protein is produced by uh, natural infection or natural infection and um, vaccination. 
So the question as to whether vaccination generates trimeric spike protein is actually unclear. Um, if it doesn't, the levels of natural immunity are much higher, uh, much higher and much better than, than, than we would have thought. Now, Office of National Statistics says this, a negative antibody test does not mean that a person is not protected. Quite correct. A person may have tested positive for antibodies at one time, but then have a negative test later on. Direct quote. And of course, the antibodies could go down, but the B and T cells can still be there giving immunity. Antibody threshold level, levels and measurements, just to give a little, nearly finished, but give a little bit of uh, more detail on this. Pretty interesting. Uh, our standard threshold uses an antibody positivity estimates of 42 nanograms per mil. In other words, if it's 40 um, nanograms, it won't pick it up. It won't pick it up. And we know that antibody levels wane pretty quickly. Um, th therefore, uh, th threshold that uh, the test is uh, CE approved, so European certification approved, uh, as approved by the Measures Healthcare Regulatory Authority. In other words, this figure is 42 nanograms per mil figures chosen, not because they like the sound of that number, or they think it's clinically useful, but because it's a threshold for the test. In other words, it's the art of the possible. And of course, that's that's reasonable. We can only do what we can do. So the reason they pick that threshold level is because that's what the test does. So people with 32 nanograms per mil of antibodies, they, they, they will have been exposed. If, if they're below the age of vaccination, they've definitely been exposed. Um, but that's not picked up by the test because antibody levels wane. Um, Anyway, the test is 99% uh, sensitivity and specificity, which is good, in identifying people who have had a coronavirus COVID-19 infection before natural immunity from people who have had not. So they're saying here that this is di differentiating between natural immunity and people who haven't had it. So it looks like that trimeric spike protein that we were talking about is only generated by natural immunity. That's what that seems to be saying. Now, I am hoping to... I'll get, I'm going to get clarification on this soon because it's not clear at the moment. Hopefully, Paul Hunter will answer the question and we'll, we'll, have, it, uh, we'll have it unambiguously. But if it is that this is only testing for natural immunity, then it means those figures we looked at for antibody thresholds are much more encouraging than we thought. So uh, clarification needed on that, but uh, it's either good or much better. The standard threshold of 42 nanograms per mil corresponds to 23 binding antibody units per mil. So what these are, these, these are the antibodies, these are an immunoglobulin type uh, Gs. And the, these are molecules, and they're kind of Y-shaped like this. They've got a body, and they've got two arms like that. They've got, literally got two arms. And in the end of the arm, there's a very specific shape like that which is the reciprocal shape of the antigen. Because remember, this is the antibody, and the antibody is the body's response to the antigen. So these are, so presumably if there's 23 of the, 23 per mil of blood, that means there's 23 of these per mil of blood. These, these are units. And the thing about this, 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 this bit on the end is called the multivariable unit. So this bit's the same in most antibodies. Uh, it's this bit here that varies, and it's that bit there which is designed to be the reciprocal shape of the antigen, in this case, uh, part of the SARS coronavirus 2 virus. And it fits onto it, it fits onto it like that. So if we were drawing this more to scale, um, here, here we'd have a virus like that. So that would be that would be that would be the virus like that. And uh, the the antibody, and, and here we've got various um, antigens, such as spike proteins. Well, we could draw the full spike, I suppose. It'd be like, but that, so that's the antigen on the end of it there, like that. There's a, there's other antigens there, of course, but these are the ones on the spike proteins. So there's particular uh, antigens on there, and what these antibodies do, they will recognise that, and they will bind onto these specific shapes like this. So you'll end up with a, an antibody there like that, bi binding onto it uh, like that. And if it's bound onto it, that means that that's actually fixed onto there. So that means instead of being this shape, like that, instead of being that shape, the, the spike protein, instead of being that shape there that we've coloured in, it actually becomes this shape here. It becomes this shape in. Of course, that means it can't fit into the ACE2 receptor site anymore. So it essentially changes the shape. That, that, that's how the neutralization works. So you come to the receptor that this would like to fit into, like this. And whereas that would fit into it nicely, this won't because it's the wrong shape. 
That's the principle of neutralising antibodies. And the IgG ones, of course, are the more longer-lived ones. The, the IgM ones are produced first. They're immediate, and then the IgG ones are produced. But even these only last for a, a few months. So there we go. Um, it, vaccine to under fives is being rolled out in the UK, but it has to be said with no greater enthusiasm as far as I read the uh, as far as I read the information. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. Unless you're an academic. Now, if you're an academic, um, I just want to show you something briefly. Now, this is from uh, Wafafa in Africa, and he's been doing this survey with some of his colleagues, and it's a questionnaire for community diagnosis. And they're collecting information on lots of different uh, lots of different things. Um, so background information there, uh, childhood, death, stillbirth, sickness of the mother during pregnancy, poor feeding, malnutrition, diseases. Uh, do you have any nutritional deficiencies in childhood? Quashiacore marasmus, failure to thrive. Um, Quashi, of course, particularly uh, protein deficiency. Of course, marasmus is typically carbohydrate energy deficiency. These days we tend to call it protein energy malnutrition. But anyway, um, do you have any children or babies with congenital abnormalities? What are the common causes of death at home, if any? Uh, do you sleep under a treated uh, insecticide mosquito net? Do you brush your teeth? Um, do you use a brush to brush your teeth? What's the main source of water for your home? Do you boil your water for drinking? Uh, what is your source of food? And it goes on. How many meals do you have a day? Um, <clears throat> do your children eat in the same plate, uh, in the same uh, plate from the same plate as adults? Uh, what do you? How do you prepare your food? Do you have a drying rack for utensils? All sorts of things. That um, do you have a pit latrine toilet? Uh, do you have had hand washing facilities near your pit latrine? Of course, many many don't causing faecal or transmission. So when washing your hands, have you ever gone to school? What's the highest educational level you attained? How far is the nearest school from you? Um, what do you do for a living? Most common diseases you suffer from on uh, quite, quite a lot of data there, all directly related to health. And it goes on to pregnancy and childbirth, uh, family planning and contraception, uh, religion, do you have any cultural or religious beliefs that could impact on health? Um, lots of things. So the, re the reason I've put this on here is um, Wafaf has collected this data from quite a few people now. Um, but what he's looking for um, is, is a, an, ac an academic partner uh, from a hope well, any university really, preferably a Western university, to help him uh, collect and analyse this data and convert it into papers. So he's collected uh, loads and loads of data. He's still collecting loads of more data. And if there was some interest and, uh, well, to be quite honest, some minimal funding, we could collect loads and loads of data and really get a handle on what is causing pain, suffering, death and disease in these poor African communities. Now, I haven't got, I haven't got um, the, the time or capacity to take this on at the moment. It's, it's a huge... Uh, well, it's, it's a big academic work, so it would make a brilliant uh, master's project. It would make a brilliant uh, um, PhD thesis. And it would also be remarkably good for uh, academics because there's so much raw data there which could be rapidly converted into paper uh, to papers. And, of course, um, Western universities need to publish lots and lots of papers. So if you're... Um, if you're an academic, um, get, I'll put the link for Rafafa in, in the title. If you're interested in this partnership, you could contact me, um, but but con or contact Rafafa directly, and um, let's start gathering data which will inform us better um, how to improve health in rural communities, and that would be well worth doing, wouldn't it? So, um, any interested academics um, would make an would make an excellent MD thesis as well, uh, medical doctor thesis. Um, it's a bit different. In, in, in the United States, MDs is anyone who's a doctor, whereas an MD in the UK is actually a doctorate. It's a higher order, it's a higher order uh, doctoral degree. So it would make a good uh, MD postgraduate uh, medical degree uh, as well for anyone interested in that. So um, or academic supervisors, you, you got the message. Um, lots of data there just waiting to be wrung out to get 
proper information that's really going to help people's lives, which is what we're into. Thank you for watching.